Hello, everybody, and welcome to my critical series on Shadow of the Colossus. Those familiar with my channel might note that I've sort of attempted this before, but I felt that those videos lacked the necessary focus and sort of critical eye that this game really deserves, and that this game sort of needed. I made a language mistake and said that I was more interested in sort of the narratological end of things compared to the ludic, and I don't think that was correct of me to say. I'm more concerned with the semiotics in this game, the process of meaning making in this game, and that can occur not only through the attribution of meaning to the symbols that we see and the story elements that we encounter, but it can also occur as a result of the ludic pressure that the game exerts on us. Immediately, I want to talk about the hawk we saw at the start of this sequence. Hawks have a large association with souls and spirits. Valkyries could change into hawks and carry the souls of warriors to Valhalla. In ancient Rome, uh, hawks were released when important figures died. The Aztecs viewed hawks as intermediaries between this world and the next. And so I think for this game, the hawk is an omen of things to come, a sign of the soul-related magic that our protagonist, Wander, will take part in. It's also important to note that hawks are one of the few animals that we will encounter in the game space at all. There are hawks, a couple of lizards, not much happening in the game space, so the image of the hawk is actually this recurring motif that we see even as we're playing the game itself and not in a cutscene. Light and shadow are also important in this game, in ways that are sometimes difficult to explain. We want to note how, at the start of the sequence, it was nighttime, and we were in this sort of darkness, and now as we move into the game space, we'll see that behind this wall, and behind this wall is the game space, there's all of this bright, highly diffused light. And I think that the way that 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 light will cover the game space as we navigate it, or at least it will cover the majority of it, is sort of important to creating this feeling of otherworldliness, or even a heavenly feel, because this is actually a holy land that we are entering. It is an area full of magic, and gods, and ritual, and giants, and I think that the bright light truly stresses that in a way that just simple sunlight wouldn't. And even though we see that there is some sort of human presence in this space, through this amazing bridge with this really cool architecture, we also see that all of that human sort of presence is presented in very grand imagery. So this bridge, you can actually climb up to it later in the game, and to cross this bridge, because you won't have your horse, it takes about 10 full minutes, maybe even 15. So the scale of the game world, even the human elements, compared to the natural elements, really shows how small your character is in compared to this very majestic, magical land. And you can even see that right here on the title screen. I'm going to load a game. I'm actually going to be playing what is sort of a new game plus, which means I'll have some extra weapons and things that will make the Colossi encounter, I encounter, excuse me, a little easier, mostly because talking about a game and, you know, fighting giant monsters is, is a little difficult. Um, I won't use all of the tools at my disposal, but I will use some in order to make the battles I take part in a little easier because I'm not really interested in those things from a combat standpoint. I'm interested in them from sort of a puzzle standpoint and also how they are representative of spaces that I need to navigate. Climbing a, a colossus is no different than climbing the landscape, really. This game is largely about navigation and space and sort of even though we're we're just a human, a small individual, navigating this large game world, fighting these large enemies. And we'll talk about how the mechanics stress that point and how the imagery stresses that point a little later on in this video.
I like this moment of descending into the temple because it sort of reminds me of a descent into the underworld. Particularly because at the end of this descent, we're going to talk to a god and take part in ritual, in magic. When the door closes, everything becomes shadowed. And so in my mind, when I look at this scene, I, I, I think of how I might relate it to other mythological stories, because I think that Shadow of the Colossus is sort of a modern-day myth. In my mind, when I'm looking at this descent, I think of the story of Orpheus, who went down into Hades to retrieve his love, Eurydice. Wander is doing something very similar here. He's descending into this temple where he'll interact with a god of death in order to revive the woman that he's carrying now. That woman's name is Mono. And so we have a basic notion of what's going on as we move a little bit further into the cutscene. We understand that Mono is somebody who's important to wander, important enough to go on this quest, but we're never told what their relationship is, whereas we know that the relationship between Orpheus and Eurydice is a romantic one, here we, we don't fully know the story between Mono and Wander. And I think that's one of the large strengths of this game. The player sort of becomes the god between the gaps that fills in the story with meaning, or at least with some form of context the story sort of becomes what the player imagines it to be. It can be as simple as a story about somebody going on a quest to kill monsters, or it can take on larger symbolic meaning. We don't ever really understand the nature of the god we encounter in this area too, Dorman. The player really needs to understand the space, and sort of figure out what's going on. So even here we have images of ritual, which people might see differently or, or with different sort of feeling. Um, not to get too pedantic, but Wittgenstein says that language distracts from thought. This game right here will have a lot of exposition, but it will dispose of a lot of explicit language for the majority of the game, allowing a sort of contemplative examination of all of the factors. So we listen here, and while there is a language and sort of a an oral history being told, it's in a very foreign tongue that we don't understand. The language doesn't have much meaning, even though there are subtitles to sort of tell us what is being said. After these opening sequences are complete, we're sort of left to ourselves. And again, to be a little pedantic, we're going to suffer from the same self-diagnosed disease that Roland Barthes says that he suffered from. He said that he sees language. In this game, we're going to see language as well, whether it's the language of the landscape, the language of our characters' movements, the language of the design of each colossi, the language of the composition of shots like this, and we're going to put a lot of meaning into them. This game is entirely what you sort of make in terms of visual associations and symbolic associations. So here is another example. These shadows, in my mind, evoke images of the shadows that you encounter in Eco, in the Queen's Castle. And there are explicit connections between Shadow of the Colossus and Eco, but I don't think that you need to have a knowledge of Eco in order to understand Shadow of the Colossus. Shadow of the Colossus can stand on its own as its own story. Here we have very archetypal imagery, archetypal, imagery of sort of a hero with a magic sword using that magic sword to dispel monsters. And if we want to, we can sort of look at this from a very basic light Campbell tinge. We don't have all of those multiple steps of Campbellian, uh, you know, that journey, but 
if we want to, we can see it as a quest of somebody from possibly low birth with a magic sword going and fighting monsters and all of these things. This is Dorman, the god of the land here, of this forbidden holy land. And I want to stress that in terms of the light and shadow dichotomy we've been talking about, it's very interesting that Dorman talks to us from above, from this hole that has light coming down from, from up, where we might think of a soul being, a, a, a god that can control life or death as evil, we have light imagery. And we should listen to Dorman's voice here. Dorman has both masculine and feminine qualities to it. It isn't bound by the same dichotomies or rules that humans are in this world. In one case, that's gender. Dorman defying, is, you know, isn't defined by gender. Dorman is this sort of collective individual. And then also, as a collective individual, um, they might be a singular being as we understand it, but they're not singular in the same way that mortals are. And even here, Dorman is talking about how souls that are lost cannot be reclaimed, but that is a mortal law. Dorman is removed from those laws. Some people who look at this game will note that Dorman is an anagram for Nimrod. Uh, Nimrod was a king in the Bible. I forget which book, but I believe Nimrod worshipped sort of heretical gods, which might speak to the nature of Dorman a little bit. We understand that Dorman might be a, a heretical god to Wander's people. I'm more interested in the term Nimrod, though, in the way that it appears in Dante's Inferno. Nimrod is this giant that stomps around and patrols the circle of treachery in that story. And I can't remember what lair of hell that is, but I think it's very interesting that in that story, Nimrod is a giant, and then in this story, we will have giants that we have to conquer. I don't know if any of this is intentional on the part of the writer, but I don't know if intent matters in this case. The text is merely a blueprint that we look at and that we imbue with meaning. The, you know, the pathway that meaning comes from, it's not text to player, it's player to text. And so if somebody wants to look at this game and say, well, Dorman is an anagram for Nimrod, and, or, um, not even that, it's not even an anagram, it's, um, it's, it's Nimrod spelled backwards, um, no, it's not, I'm having trouble with language, um, I can't picture it in my head, a little bit of strange dyslexic thought there, but if somebody wants to look at the story and think, oh, well, Dorman is representative of Nimrod, who is representative of, you know, these images in the Bible, that's a valid interpretation, and that's a valid sort of meaning-making that somebody brings to the text. For me, Dorman reminds me of Lucifer in Marlowe's Faust, um, because Dorman warns Wander that there is a price to be paid, and in Faust, the contract between Lucifer and Faust is very clear. Faust gives up 24 years of his life, and then, you know, he has all these magical powers, but then he, you know, his his soul is claimed by Satan. For Wander, he makes this deal with Dorman, and then his body and soul will likely be claimed by Dorman as well. And now we're into gameplay. And I like the fact that we start off the game right in front of our objective. And it might be uncomfortable to think of mono as objective, because if you look at it from a gendered lens, it's easy to see mono as sort of a princess in a castle that we have to save, or some sort of reward we get at the end of our journey. But I think looking at it through that lens removes a lot of the symbolic power that mono has. So even looking at this scene, mono has all of this light behind her, She's wearing this light, you know, white garb. And that evokes images, in my mind, of purity and innocence and 
all of these sort of things that might be lost. So for me, this isn't a story about a man necessarily saving a woman. It's a story about a human going on a quest against, you know, insurmountable odds in order to restore sort of purity and hope and innocence that might have been wrongly taken. We know that Mono was sacrificed for having a cursed fate, but that cursed fate might be little more than superstition. Movement on our horse, Agro, is very, um is very smooth, which will be important to understanding movement when we are wander off the horse. When we're on the horse, we can do all sorts of cool tricks. You know, we can take out our bow, we can stand up and shoot arrows, we, we can do all kinds of interesting stuff. But once we're off aggro, we, we won't have as much surety of movement, which is important, you know, from a ludic standpoint in terms of the tension that it exerts on the player. So... You'll see that when I get off aggro, when I walk, it's very awkward. When I swing my sword, it's it's not with a lot of skill or precision. And even when I climb here, it's a very sort of arduous task. This lack of refined movement, in my mind, in conjuncture with the size of our enemies and the size of the game world, exerts a ludic tension upon the player that's really meant to evoke a sense of existential smallness, as well as physical smallness. The physical smallness is the most readily apparent one, but we're also on a journey where we are encountering gods and these sort of large magical creatures, and that sort of makes us, as a human entity, unsure of our place in the world that we are in. And I think it's supposed to, all of these, you know, gameplay elements are supposed to make us feel conflicted about wander physically, about wander metaphysically. It's, it's very interesting to me. This is our first Colossus. This is Valus. Valus is also called the Minotaur Colossus. So we can draw whatever mythological allegory there that we choose to. Sort of a, a monster that we have to overcome. Although Valis is very passive, whereas the Minotaur of the Labyrinth, I believe, was a little more active. So Valis actually won't go after us until we get its attention. In Latin, Valis means point, which I think stresses the fact that these colossi that we face are sort of natural points in the landscape. You'll see some that are contained in prisons, we'll see some that are sleeping, and but they're all of these sort of focal points that are not just physical focal points, but also focal points of sort of magic and wonder and beauty. The noun vallum can mean rampart or wall, and on the back of vallis we're going to see these things that are sort of evocative of ramparts. Hopefully I can shoot my arrow and get Valis's attention. And then of course we think of the the word Valor itself, which has the same sort of root. Uh, valor as a word comes from Valeo, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, which means I am strong, which can sort of refer to the pure brute strength of the Colossus here. Or it can refer to the courage, the sort of spiritual strength of Wander going on this very dangerous quest. And so now we see the Colossus here as sort of a puzzle, a very simple puzzle. We see a weak point and we have very limited tools, so we sort of intuit that we need to stab it. And this is going to play into that image of strength from before, right? So I can actually stab that calf, and I exert my own strength on this large figure to make it fall on its knees. And now I, I need to navigate the space of the Colossus, which is why I said that I'm more interested in each Colossi as its own sort of moving landscape or as its own puzzle where I need to figure out how to get onto it and how to navigate it, as opposed to this big creature I'm doing epic battle with. Although certainly, epic is an adjective we can use in this game. 
even though it tends to be an adjective that people use with a uh, little care in a lot of cases. Right here, these are the sort of ramparts that I was talking about. They serve a very simple gameplay function where you start off the game with a grip gauge that's very small. It's one of the few things that are actually, you know, an, ab an abstraction in, in the game. And you'll see as I climb, eventually you'll see my grip gauge. It's going to be this sort of pink circle. You can see the outline there. It's one of the few things that are, is really an abstraction in the game space. Otherwise, it's all very minimalistic in terms of what it does with the UI. It just sort of shows your health, your weapon, and then, and then your, you know, the monster's health. The grip gauge is just an abstraction for your stamina. Here the music is very somber. I'm not sure if you can hear it. But there's this notion that killing a colossus is sort of this strange or unnatural act. And we'll talk about that as we slay more of them. For now, we're interested in what happens after you kill a colossus. They turn black as they're sort of robbed of their magic, and that magic sort of enters us, and you can see that we emanate this sort of dark fog. And again, we associate darkness, or at least I do, with Dorman, and sort of maybe a nefarious intent. Even though Dorman was honest with us at the beginning, Dorman might still be manipulating us. Certainly we're being manipulated because we don't fully understand the task of what we're doing for Dorman. It's just this sort of mutual exchange where Wander serves Dorman, and here the shadow might even be a, a part of Dorman that was released when we killed Vallis. We're not entirely sure. That's another thing we can imbue with our own meaning and significance or context. But we do know that we're going on this quest, and we don't necessarily have a clear idea of what Dorman wants, even though we have a clear idea of what Wander wants. I like the use of space here. Generally, we have a large landscape, we have large camera shots. Here we have physical proximity between Wander and Mono, and that physical proximity implies a very strong intimacy. The only other entity in the game that we will have a physical intimacy with is Agro, our horse. And here we, we see that we're destroying these idols in this temple, which we might choose to interpret as a form of desecration or religious sacrilege, but we don't necessarily have to look at it that way. We just know that we're sort of destroying magical things to potentially serve this ambiguous god figure. And once again, Dorman is one of the few characters that keeps in any communication with us language-wise. In fact, the only character. If we take too long slaying a colossus, Dorman will actually give us hints. They want to guide us on our journey. So here again we have that physical intimacy between Wander and Mono, and then you pull back and the camera very quickly, once you go into space, gives you a larger view of the space, which also helps with that feeling of existential smallness I was talking about. And as we can see, like I said, the only other individual you have physical intimacy with is Agro, right here. But that was our first Colossus. I hope that you enjoyed what we talked about here. I hope it had a little bit more focus than the previous videos I did. And I think we'll definitely do a video per Colossus. There's only 16 in this game. This game, on its most basic level, is just a, a big boss rush. Um, and so there's 16 enemies for us to uncover, even though we have to navigate this very large game world at the same time. And we will move on to our second Colossus in the next part. I hope you enjoyed this. If you do, keep on following along. Thank you very much for listening. I, I, I really want to talk about what this game is doing. I think this game is an important game, and, and I hope I can properly articulate that to you as we move on. I will hopefully see you in part two. Bye!